All right, it's 11 o'clock sharp. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Chris Marty. I'm the Vice President of Data Analytics and Executive Education at MSCI. Very briefly, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. You're listening to com computer audio by default when you're using Zoom. If you want to change the audio to your telephone, you can do that using the Zoom settings. I believe it's called audio settings in the lower left. We do want you to submit questions today. Um, that's a big part of this session. The next hour is a lot of interactions. So we really encourage you to ask questions at any time. We'll interrupt Todd, we'll do whatever we need to do to get your questions answered. Uh, so please do that for us. And again, for today's session, your audio is gonna be muted the whole time. So the only way for you to interact with us is to use that Q and A button and ask a question. Uh, the slides will be distributed after the presentation, and we are recording this, and we'll post the recording uh, probably tomorrow. And so, with all of that said, I'd like to introduce Professor Todd Milburn. For those of you who know Todd, wave hello, even though he can't see you. Can't see, it's a bummer. And if you didn't know otherwise, Todd is the Hubert C. and Dorothy R. Moog Professor of Finance and the Vice Dean of Faculty and Research at the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis. Todd's expertise is in corporate finance and his research interests are likewise, corporate finance, managerial concerns, management compensation, and maybe appropriate to today, the economics of asymmetric information. Just a quick note on Todd. Todd's been teaching in our strategic metals management program since the very beginning about 15 years ago. So Todd, welcome. We're all looking forward to this. So um, it is, it's up to you now. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Well, hey, good morning, maybe good afternoon, just barely for the East Coast folks from here. Um, I know there's, I saw a bit of the attendee list, so I know we've got a few uh, familiar pieces on there. Um, unfortunately, I can't see your face, which is kind of a bummer. But uh, so Chris and I just get to look at each other's ugly mugs and we can't see uh, yours. And that's all you get to see either. So that's fair. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, as, uh, as Chris said, my name is Todd Milborn. Um, that long-winded title basically means I don't have a real job. All right, so those that can do, those that can't teach, I've apparently gone to that side of things uh, from a finance capacity. So um, I'm going to pull up some slides, definitely post some questions along the way. Um, Chris is going to be sort of my moderator. He's going to be able to look at those because once I get rolling, you know, I get too excited about this stuff. That's going to be important and we'll kind of break things up that way. I've got maybe 20, 22, 25 minutes or so of some kind of pictures, data, graphs, things that I want to show. A little bit of, hey, here's sort of my agnostic, outside of the market, not tied, well, tied to education, but not tied necessarily to an industry. Some thoughts on kind of why we're seeing some of the things we're seeing. But this is always better with Q&A. Um, and since I don't have a real job, I just get to make stuff up. And so we'll do some, uh, we'll do the best that we can from here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. I will be occasionally writing on here. If we need to like, you know, somebody really wants a math equation, I'm absolutely going to jump in and we'll get the whiteboard going. I've got my handy dandy $30 uh, Surface Pro pencil ready to rock and roll as we're, uh, as we're kicking off. So I'm really honored to be here. I have been with the metals group literally since class one in the strategic metals management uh, program. And so I know that I've got a chance to meet a lot of you over time. Um, and hopefully we'll be seeing each other in person again soon, or at least maybe two dimensionally and some smaller cohorts from there. So here's what I wanted to do. <clears throat> As Chris said, um, I'm going to make a copy of these slides available. There's nothing proprietary in there. There's no sort of secret sauce of how to go make $11 billion out in financial markets. But obviously, we're in a very different world. And so I've kind of titled this. I made sure that I matched the webinar. Financial markets and COVID-19. Sounds uh, pretty onerous. Right? But really, what I want to look at is what the heck do we make of all of this right now? Right. And as you said, I'm over at WashU. I'm easy to track down. At the end of this, if you've got questions, thoughts, concerns, literally there's only two professors of finance in the world named Todd. Now we both happen to work at WashU, but I'm the old fart rather than the young guy. I'm easy to track down, shoot me an email. This stuff is always fun for me and it's always fun to work with, uh, with the folks that are represented here. All right, so what I'm gonna start off with is just sort of some basic facts before we jump in and then turn over from sort of real economy to what are we thinking about and what are we seeing in financial markets from there. I, you can't open up your news feed without seeing bad news. 
Now, everybody's kind of forgotten about the pandemic for about two, two and a half weeks. Now we're starting to talk about it again. But for the last, you know, three, four months, that's all we've been talking about. And importantly, all we see here is bad economic news, right? Job loss and furloughs at record levels. I'll show you some contacts for that. For shelter in place, right? I know it happened on March 23rd for the state of Missouri because that was my birthday. And I'm like, oh, happy birthday to me. Um, I gave myself a little, uh, you know, a couple beers to celebrate from there. But that date is stuck out um, with sort of more certainty than it would have other words. otherwise. The shelter in place clearly has affected some consumption, consumption's down, and all we keep talking about is how long might this recession be? Now, the question out of sort of these facts or situational pieces that are listed above is what are financial markets saying about this? What's changed as we've sort of gone through this cycle of learning, getting a little bit more information about what this, um, what this disease ultimately is? And ultimately, maybe a little bit of, hey, what should we be doing? I'm going to take a bit more of a sort of as a personal investor standpoint, but in the questions, and I think natural to come up, where do we see this sort of affecting our industry collectively here? So let's start with some of the bad economic news. Now, one thing I do want to mention, we're going to try to keep this interactive so you don't minimize this and just keep clearing emails because it's been shown uh, scientifically, we can't actually multitask. So the way I'm going to draw you back in, we're going to do a couple of polls along the way just to take the temperature in the room. But let's start with sort of the most obvious bad piece of economic news is a ton of people are out of work. So I just grabbed a screenshot. This was probably about three and a half weeks ago now. So getting right at the end, maybe four weeks, end of uh, May 23rd is every day, certainly through March and April and a good part into May, new job loss claims were coming in, right? And at one point, this thing peaked for unemployment at over 20%. Where we sit as of this morning, when I'm reading about how we're gonna change some more immigration uh, laws for displaced workers, we're still sitting a bit over 13%. Now, to put that in context, this just comes directly from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. They've got great data on interest rates, the aggregate economy, right? and they're often called the, uh, the FRED data, right? Federal Reserve Economic Data. And this is just tracking the unemployment rate over time. You know, we're going back, what at this point, geez, 1950? We're going back you know, seven decades from here. Now, just a little bit of context on our vertical is the percentage of unemployment that we're seeing. And, you know, naturally, as the economy cycles up and down, unemployment is going to naturally go up. Sometimes we're in hard times, people are laid off. Other times we are sort of just crushing it with incredibly low um, unemployment. When you look at this graph back to 1950, and these gray areas represent where there's been a recession, clearly there's going to be a gray area coming in starting in April and May of this year. And the billion or even trillion dollar question is how wide is that gray bar going to be? And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. But as we see from here, right, obviously you see some spikes coming in and leading into recessions, right? Unemployment is going to go up any time that we've hit a slowdown in economic activity. But this jump in the months of April and May, all right, so these are data sitting in the middle of May. It's come down a little bit. It was still up near 15%. Right? Crazy levels of jobless claims. Right? Now, the question is, why does this unemployment matter so much? Well, if you're the one getting unemployed, that's a pretty obvious answer to that particular question. But assuming you're on this call, I'm going to assume you're gainfully employed. Why does this unemployment matter scare economists, scare market participants so much? I mean, that's an obvious, also a pretty easy answer, right? Job loss is going to negatively affect consumer spending. People are spending less. There's less demand for services. You're going to lay off more. And maybe we get into sort of a vicious cycle that's there. All right, now, I want to take a quick poll. I'm going to have Chris launch poll number one in just a second. What I want you to do, just so we can get a sense of how much consumer spending has gone down, is think about what you would look like in a normal month relative to what you saw show up on your credit card in say April or May, right? So for a percentage either drop or a percentage increase, right? How much is your personal consumption down from what would normally be the case? Hey, Chris, can you launch poll number one? And we'll give you about 30 seconds or roughly to fill that up. Poll launched. 
All right. Hey, my spending's gone up or stayed the same? It's down about, you know, a little less than 20, somewhere between zero to 20, somewhere between 20 to 40, 41 to 60, down more than 60. Is me, Todd? I don't know that I could answer this question very accurately right now. How come? I, I'm not paying enough attention. <laughs> I've definitely seen it on my credit card. I'm going to give you my number as we get through. All right, why don't we go ahead and end it and uh, show those results. All right, so what do we got? We got about a fifth of you. It's gone up or stayed the same, right? Maybe I should have put who's actually gone up. If you got small kids in the house, you may have been investing in play sets. Uh, you may have been investing in a whole host of other things. Your yard may be on point now, so maybe you've put some, uh, some costs in there. Looks like we got 43% biggest number down, 1% to 20%. Another fifth, 20 to 40. Uh, just under 10 in the 40 to 60. And I got 1 in 20 people that are like me. I, my month of April was ultimately down 75%. I pretty much run everything through my credit card. So I wasn't thinking of, you know, hey, I'm going to keep paying my mortgage. I'm going to keep making my Ford Raptor payment. All those things still need to take place. But how much is my overall consumption going down? And in the month of April, I was down 75%. Right? So I'm going to stop sharing these results from there. Now, we look across the board. All right? We'll stop the share results on this one. Close that up from there. Why does this matter so much that overwhelmingly we've seen a decline? Some only 20%, some 50, some maybe like me with a drop of 75% from that piece. Well, it matters so much because at the end of the day, this is basically what drives our overall economy, right? So this gives you a little bit more on the aggregate economy from here. So this was written by Forbes somewhere around in April, I grabbed it. And this was looking right at the end of March. And in March alone, where we'd only had about a week, week and a half of shelter in place, I know some of the coasts were about a week ahead of the Midwest in locking us all down on home arrest, right? But consumer spending dropped seven and a half percent. To put that in context, ever since the Commerce Department has been tracking this data, and they've been tracking these data forever, prior to the month of March 2020, the largest decline we had ever seen in any singular month was only 2.1%, right? And so in just a partial month, we are three times that side. Importantly, that those data would include the time period of the great global financial crisis that led to the great recession. There we didn't see consumption falling off as quickly and as massively as we saw from here, right? So we got layoffs, consumption is way down. Why does that matter so much? Well, you've probably seen this because everybody wants to refer to this. At the end of the day, our overall economy, almost 70%, 70 cents of every dollar we collectively produce and sell as a nation, 70 cents out of every dollar is coming from our own consumption. Going to restaurants, travel, leisure, electronics, technology, new flat screen TVs, et cetera. Right? And if 70% of our economy is now going to take this 20, 30, even 40% drop, clearly that's suggesting that we are in ridiculously hard times. Right? So with that, the question I'm posing here is a lot of bad economic news. In fact, it's pretty hard to find positive economic news. Glimmers of hope here and there post-March 23rd, but up until that point, it's pretty bad. So second question I'm going to tee up here in just a second Without looking at your phone, don't pull up another website and look up Yahoo Finance. There is no grade here. It's kind of like exec ed. You don't get a report card. And so this is all about just your gut feeling. Is how bad do you think the stock market, and I'm going to use the S&P 500 as that stock market indicator, how much is that down year to date? To give you a bit of an anchor or a point of context from there, the S&P 500 in 2008, as we hit the global financial crisis, Jan 1 of 2008 to December 31st of 2008, the S&P 500 was down just shy of 38%, something like 37.5, right? Small stocks were down about 60 plus percent. Emerging market portfolios down about 80, 85%. Right? Given all this bad economic news, bigger drops, let's take another poll if you could launch that, Chris. What is your best guess of where the S&P 500 sits year to date? Hey, Todd, while, while yeah. we're waiting for people to vote, quick yeah. question. Um, 
This is from Peter Blakely in the audience. Did the, did the stimulus package um, help raise consumer spending, do you think? Without question. So Peter, that's a great question. I'm actually going to pull up some data and that'll show up as sort of point number three of maybe why the market isn't quite as bad as what would be indicative from those data from there. So let me give you a much fuller answer because I've got some stats of how much stimulus came in, but unequivocally the speed and the scale of the Fed and the U.S. government's intervention to this drastically changed things. It's a great question, Peter. All right, looks like we had just a little over three quarters, a few more people on the poll from now. Let's go ahead and share those results and I'll talk through them. All right, so we've got about four in 10 of you that have been really paying attention to the stock market and you are exactly right. The market is down between zero and five will come through. All right, but a little over a third of you, like, geez, it must be down five to 15. 15 to 25%, looks like about one in 10 of you are like, hey, it's gotta be down close to that, down more than 25%. If I hadn't needed to look at Yahoo Finance kind of pretty much every day, because I'm going to jump into teaching finance or talking to somebody, I always have to check what's ultimately happening. I would have absolutely been guessing something much more in that zone of sort of 15 to 25. And I absolutely had to have that. I'm too scared to look. So thank you for the five very honest people from there. All right, we can go ahead and stop sharing that one, Chris. I guess actually I have control to be able to do that as well. Now, to be clear, the S&P 500 down 38, there's gonna see some variation here, all right? So here's what I wanna take us through. The stock market ultimately is only down. And actually if I'd updated it at noon, but you got last night at 10 p.m. was the latest financial market information I was gonna be able to capture for you. So here's just a graph from Yahoo Finance. We're starting Jan 1, 2020, and we're sitting here as of close of markets yesterday, 22nd of June. What has the S&P 500 done? And from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, right now the S&P has only lost about three and a half cents on the dollar. As of this morning, the market was up by more than half a percent. So we're really sitting pretty close to only being down about three. Now, you may not recognize the ticker sitting on his, this IXIC, but you're absolutely going to recognize the index that it represents. That's the NASDAQ. Right? NASDAQ actually is up 11% on the year. And there is certain, excuse me, there is certainly some um, overlap between firms that are listed on the NASDAQ. I'll highlight a handful of those and what are sitting in the S&P 500. For those of you that don't know, right, I know we've got some CFOs and others on here that clearly know exactly how the S&P 500 is put together, but think of it as the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the U.S. All right, so you got number one, Microsoft worth some $1.45 trillion. That sits up there. You're going to have an Apple, you're going to have an Amazon, you're going to have the Googles, and you get all the way down to the 500th company. And then the remaining, geez, 6,500 companies that are publicly traded start at 501, going all the way down to 7,000. So it's an index only grabbing 500, but it is grabbing 70 to 75% of the money invested. And so we often use it as an overall market indicator of where the ultimate economy is going. Now, I wanted to highlight a couple things from here, right? Message is a ton of bad news, but the market's really not down that much. But let's be clear, as of March 23rd, right, which turned out to be the absolute bottom of the market thus far, and I'm hoping it's the bottom of the market for the whole year, and I'm optimistic that it was, but one never knows. Sitting there at March 23rd, I apologize that plus minus is just part of Yahoo Finance and it's part of the screenshot. We were down 31%, All right? So from Jan 1 to March 23rd, there was a precipitous decline. Now, what happens in that space, and I'll come back to this picture, think of what's happening is there's bad news. We're scared. People start pulling their investment dollars. Think of it like a casino you're pulling your chips off of the bet on the S&P 500. Now you're selling out at prices that are falling, but if you get out back here, obviously you're better out than maybe me who got out back here. Now, where does that cash go? That's not being stuffed under mattresses. It has a flight to safety. We'll often call that a flight to quality. So what's happened over this January to kind of May and June standpoint is huge money going into safe places. All right, let's park it in something that I know is guaranteed. All right, I know the US government will make good on whatever interest 
as meager as that number looks at one and a quarter percent. I know the U.S. government can always print money if need be, so I'm going to get my return. Well, as everyone moves their chips to bets on the U.S. Treasury, let's park it there, let's keep it safe. As there's more demand there, that's going to push Treasury prices up. And that brings interest rates on high quality goods and investments way down. And so that shift from sort of January to March, as the market's plummeting, everyone is flying into things like treasuries, money market, um, sort of mutual funds. So if you're thinking of it as being guaranteed, at least implicitly guaranteed like it was in the crisis, and it parks all the money there. And so we see a piece from that. But since that point, we've been on a pretty steady decline. Right. And so what I want to jump in, and I'll let Chris can interrupt me at any point as the questions I can see, there's a question come up, but I didn't see what it was, is, hey, the market's only down about 3%. You know, what the blank? I should have apologized in, in advance. I'm a little bit bombastic for those of you that haven't had me in class, but that's also how we have fun with finance when it's not your jam. Right? But I'm also going to be, I'll try to, uh, to keep the language clean in case you've got any kids walking through the house. All right? So the market's only down 3%. How can that possibly be true? I'm going to have four sort of quick thoughts on it, three backed by data, one that is just purely sort of speculative and educated guess from my standpoint, from talking to some people that work in the industry. All right, so first off, not every company is doing poorly. All right, the S&P 500 is a broad mix of different industries, and I try not to clutter too many different ones on here. All right, so my dark blue, so all the tickers are up here, conveniently color-coded for us. Hey, here's the overall S&P 500 down a little over 3%. All right? Clearly, some industries have gotten absolutely smashed. Right? Oil, airline, from this standpoint. Airlines, at one point, were down almost about two-thirds of value. They have recovered. You can't see it under there, but it's about sort of down 40% year-to-date. ExxonMobil in the orange, clearly down. But bringing up this market on the other side, I just sort of grabbed one. You look at Amazon, right? Now, I didn't ask about your March spending because my first two weeks in quarantine, I think I had Amazon coming three times a day. Like, well, geez, I need this, I need that, I need this. April, I got my house in order in a little bit. But Amazon is already was a behemoth, already one of the greatest monopolies we're probably ever going to see, at least this side, uh, this side of Asia. And that's up 45%, right? Anybody got a guess, Chris? What's that pink one going up there? Do you know? I'm guessing it's uh, Zoom. It is Zoom. And this is the only one where I've really kind of kicked myself in the seat multiple times. All right. So Zoom year to date is up 270%. Now, to be fair, Zoom is not part of the S&P 500 yet but you put up a 200% half year return, you'll probably crawl into the top 500 companies pretty freaking quick from there. But this is one even in middle of March. And if you've got kids, you know this was the conversation. Middle of March, all the conversations are, I don't think my kid's going back to school. We're either just about to hit spring break or we're coming back and everything's going virtual. So it's not like I needed to have awareness back in February that something like Zoom was going to take off. I could have just been, you know, even sort of a blind rat, you know, can find some cheese once in a while. In March, like, hey, maybe we should buy some Zoom. And it has just continued to crush along this way. Right? There's also a bit of what's happening. And I think the NASDAQ tells this story is big tech has been ruling the day in overall markets. It clearly still rules the day. And if I could only put my money in one place, I'm not advising this, nor am I doing it. But if I was told I could only put it in one place, I'd probably park it in the biggest businesses that are anything related to technology and information technology. It's a version of the FANG stocks, which is an acronym that gets touted around once in a while. I didn't put Facebook on here, but that's just more of a, uh, I'm not a big fan of Facebook. A, Amazon. A, Apple, N, Netflix. I couldn't find the ticker for chill. Google, I'm actually not a huge fan of. They're just an advertising company these days, but I've left it on here. Microsoft, I put in here in the pink. I think Microsoft has actually come through. And you can see Microsoft has actually done really well, up 24%, when Google, really only up seven, actually underperforming the NASDAQ. All right, so we look through and it's like, yeah, it's part of this market moving up is definitely being pulled up by these firms that are a trillion dollars. You're a trillion plus dollars at Microsoft and you've now moved up another 24%. That's moving the needle a lot more than a $100 million company going up 24%, which is why we always focus on dollars. 
Now, it's obviously been some rough times in this industry, right? In our industry that is going to be more cyclical, more tied to the real economy and not sort of the information economy from there, right? It's obviously from Jan 1 to this year, it's a pretty tough picture. I grabbed Olympic, Reliance, Nucor, uh, Kaiser, and Worthington just to kind of grab five to get them up here on this space. It's been kind of a rough spot, obviously underperforming the S&P 500 today but I tend to be a rose colored glasses guy. Like, hey, as the economy, the blue line is coming down 31%, that's the S&P. If you're tied to that cycle, it's gonna drag you absolutely down. What I'm much more interested in is what's happening going forward, All right? Clearly some bad things happen. We're still setting in a lost position year to date, but the market's all about expectations. All right. So kind of climbing up from market bottom. If you bought on March 23rd into this portfolio, even equally weighting it from here, you would absolutely be net positive. In fact, you've been tracking the recovery collectively, at least as this subset of the overall industry, a weighted average of these from here, pretty darn close to what the S&P has done, recovering 40% of its value from that standpoint. All right, so down 31 takes, you know, you got to come back up more than 30 to get back from that standpoint. All right, so we're only down 3%, all right? Well, not everybody's doing poorly. There's some clear winners in whatever this new normal is going to look at. I've got two other thoughts on this. First, and Chris and I were chatting about this yesterday when we were just kind of debriefing what the heck I was going to say. First off, the stock market is not the economy, all right? It's an expectation standing today looking forward of what we think the economy and who owns those pieces of the economy are gonna pay off in the future. So it's an expectation, not of just the next three months, next six months, the next year, it's an expectation till in some sense, the end of time. Well, let's make that more tangible. It's what do we think all of these companies are gonna do over the next 10 to 30 years? And it's so forward looking that when you take an average company out of the S&P 500, literally put up the Wall Street Journal section C on the, on the wall, throw a dart at it and grab that company. An average company, when you look at their stock price right now, right, less than 10 to 20% of that stock price today has anything at all to do with what's going to happen in the next five years. Hmm. Right, well, let's flip this on the other side. Let's just take the 10%. Well, if 10% of my value today is the next five years, that means the remaining, I'm pretty good at adding up to 100. I might have forgotten a bit of my calculus, but I'm good at adding up to 100. 90% of today's value is year six and beyond. And that's for average companies that are there. The easiest way to picture that is to think of Google, even though I kind of just threw Google under the bus as being an ad company. Google right now with a stock price, I don't know, $1,400, right? That next five years is going to pay the holder of that stock of Google or Alphabet, I can't bring myself to say it, nothing. Why? Because Google's not currently paying any dividends. They've said we're not paying one next year, unlikely to pay one the year after that. There's a really good chance they don't pay any dividend for the next five years. Well, that means five years of zero while you're holding this paper. That means 100% of Google's value today is the cash we expect to get out year six and beyond. I always think that's an example. It's kind of helpful of what's going in. So we could be in the real muck and we are in many capacities. The market can still be bullish because it's an expectation of where we're going. That was sort of the first key point I wanted to get. This gets to, I think it was Peter's question with the, uh, the government response. I was amazed and impressed at how quick, nimble and comprehensive the government response was. All right. And I'll give you a couple highlights of what they did instantaneously in March, where I think we had a huge advantage this time around is both the Federal Reserve that kind of oversees the banking system collectively and the U.S. Treasury. They had a playbook from 2008. And when the global financial crisis hit us in the fourth quarter of 2008, and obviously been brewing for a while, but when it became completely obvious to all that we were in a world of trouble, they were guessing. I, it was pure trial and error. Well, let's try this. Oh, snap, that didn't work. Let's try this. Oh, it worked a little bit, but we need some more. There's an awesome documentary I don't called Hank. 
It's up on Netflix. If you've taken the class, I think I've mentioned it in almost every class from there. It's called Hank, Five Years from the Brink. And it's set in 2013, five years from the brink of the entire financial system collapsing. And he's looking back saying, here's what went wrong. And here are the different things that we did. It's like an hour and 20 minute documentary, but it does a really good job. Watching it now would probably add a bit of color to what they've done. But they basically said, this is how we can solve and support the economy. And it was so quick. And here's some of the data that I promised Peter a bit ago. All right? Immediate three trillion dollar federal government stimulus package right cash going out now, obviously not to everybody in the economy but probably and i think appropriately where the economy was hurting the most now that also means that's roughly we got 300 million people all right that's roughly a grand per person that the government has basically handed over cash that at some point has to be repaid a lot of all 300 million of us, less than half of us are about two thirds of us are adults, less than half of adults are actually federal taxpayers. So our individual burden on this is probably about three grand per person. I'm assuming you're a federal taxpayer if you're on this call, we are going to have to pay for this party at some point. Where I think markets got the biggest bump in terms of stability came from the Federal Reserve committing $6 trillion to come in and make sure that people didn't default at a company level, that that leads to the dominoes from there. And they really expanded what they were doing. Right? Before the financial crisis, the Fed would inject money. That's a way of making the money, the markets be liquid. Think of it as you got to put some grease in the wheels. Hey, let's keep the grease in there because if that thing gets stuck, whole engine shuts down. Right. Before 08, they would put money in, but ridiculously conservatively. They'd only put it in to make sure there was a backdrop that the Treasury could keep at the U.S. level could keep paying. When we got to 08, they're like, ah, you know what, that's not going to quite cut it. The whole thing was about too much debt in houses. And so they put a lot of liquidity and capital into the mortgage market there. After 2020, they have promised to not only buy Treasuries if need be, to buy any mortgage-backed securities that may be, but to also buy exchange-traded funds of corporate bonds, not just investment-grade bonds, but bonds that come in below triple B, call them junk bonds or high-yield bonds. Right? Commercial paper, short-term loans often used to finance uh, material purchases for inventory, bank loans, small business loan pools, even municipal government bonds. They basically said, we stand here ready to make sure no market that shouldn't collapse will collapse. And that I think is what allowed, as Peter even suggested, I think he knew the answer to his question already, that that was gonna happen. Let me hey, get Tom. one and then we'll jump into the Q&A, but Chris, go ahead while we're- Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, there, there's something missing that did happen in, in the Great Recession that we haven't seen yet uh, this time. And that's um, not on the consumption, not on the financial side of the economy, but investment in infrastructure was something that did occur last time, hasn't occurred now. J just, if you could take a minute to talk about that and A, what do you think the chances of that happening are? And B, I know you're not a policy guy, but I think uh, for the companies on this call, this is critical. Absolutely. That leads, that, that's, that's a more pure and direct demand for metal than anything else we've talked about, right? Everything we've sure. talked about is, is indirect. Um, so getting something like that, wh what do you think the chances are? And then how critical is that to the economic recovery going forward? Yeah, so I'll take the, I'll take the latter question and go to the form one. I okay. think the latter question is, in my opinion, straightforward. I think it's going to be critical. Right? It's going to be critical and necessary for that industry, for the infrastructure stimulus package to come through and actually be executed and not just talked about to actually get your portion of the economy moving sooner because i think it would be a bit of a delay with commercial buildings and spaces no one's quite sure what the new world looks like are we letting people work from home etc i could see an environment where there is demand for construction but it's retrofitting and remodeling where we change commercial spaces from everybody's got sort of an office to open space you can spread out All right, so as opposed to these pits with a lot of cubicles maybe we need more space so that everybody can go through but an infrastructure stimulus is, I think, critical to get the industry going quicker than just kind of waiting for an overall recovery. 
Now, what's the likelihood? You know, I'm not a politician, but I think the likelihood of at le this at least being pushed and certainly passed by the Senate is incredibly high, right? I think the president's last sort of straw he's got now, he's gone from an economy with 4% employment, almost a sure thing to win, and probably in three to six weeks, he's watched that become much more fragile for the fall. I think that's going to be the silver bullet that he's going to push super hard to try to make sure that he gets reelected. So I think the odds of it are actually better than I would have guessed if this was six or nine months ago. Is that somewhat helpful, Chris? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. That was from Jim Hoffman. So uh... <laughs> my friend Jim, good to hear you see you, Jim, or at least hear from you, I should say. All right, last piece, and then I'm going to come back in because the Q and A should be better. Here's one that's not based on sort of facts, right? Obviously, some winners, some losers. Hey, stock market's forward-looking, so it's not going to be everything. Government response, you know, I'm not usually a big fan of what a government does. I'd like to think I'm a libertarian, but I support the military too much, so that really kind of breaks that down. But this last one is on the income drops, right? Consumption is clearly down because there was unemployment. There were furloughs from here. But the income drops overall by the end of the year, partially because of the stimulus, partially because of reopening and where they're going, are nowhere near the levels we saw from the global financial crisis, which suggests consumption recovers, right? So this is from a small sample. I sit on a board of one hedge fund. They don't take my investment advice. I just make sure the person's not stealing the money, right? Works with a whole bunch of other successful hedge fund managers. That just means it's kind of like a mutual fund at Vanguard and they're picking stocks they like or don't like across the board. Obviously, they're worried about total income for the U.S. economy and how that leads to consumption. Even though we dropped something like 7% in one, in one month, they're predicting only at 22 to 3% total for the entire year with much of that recovering by 2021. Now, put this in context of the Great Recession. When we had the Great Recession, the job layoffs and the people put out of work were on a much broader cross-section of the income earning spectrum, all right? You had people from investment banks making a million, million and a half, law firms making 500 grand, consultants making 300 to 600. There was five, eight, 10 percent unemployment there. Well, you pull somebody out who's pulling in a buck, right, at a million dollars a year, and you wreck their spending, that is a much bigger ultimate effect. Here, and this isn't to be unempathetic to who's been hit hardest during this recession in the short run, but where all of these job losses and the 13% unemployed is coming from the lowest part of our income spectrum. And if they're brought back into the economy or we deem it's actually worthwhile to do even a, maybe a more modest half the value cash injection from there, it allows the economy to come back a lot quicker. Right? Back from seven to nine, it dropped 3%. But people forget, it dropped another 7% between June of 2009 and 2011. And we're saying now instead of a 10% drop, we may only see a 2%. That I think suggests the consumer economy can come back if that come back, comes back, that then can get back to longer, more durable investments from a construction and industry standpoint from there, All right? Last thing real quick. So I think, you know, we look at the last recession, it took nearly a decade from which to crawl out. You may argue we were still not crawling out before. I'll come back to that last point. This is just a quick picture and it'll be my last slide that has any pictures on it. This just looks at some data from 07, and this was right near the end of 19. So at that point, 20 was an estimate. Don't worry about the breakdown of the boxes. You could read it. If you got questions, we'll talk about it. But the height of the box is the total cash profits and reserves that companies in the S&P 500 had. So in 07, there was just shy of $2 trillion in these 500 companies that could go to things like CapEx, R&D, acquisitions, and giving some of that money back. What we saw in 08 is that companies were hurting. It dropped. Right? It goes from $2 trillion to one and a half. We go into 09, drops to $1.2 trillion. This was a much bigger drop in the profits that these companies had had. And yeah, from a proportion, it looks like a great recovery. But I always like to draw this line from here of why I think we were still crawling out. Yeah, we had great percentages, but we were sitting in a 60% hole for Christ's sake, right? We were still crawling out from here. And I think that's why it was such a slow one and even more painful for everyone on this call. And I think for a lot of industries from there. Last piece, and I saw, let me just get my last bullet. 
what I think makes this recession different than any other recession we have seen is this recession was not induced because we had too much debt in the system. It wasn't induced because we had people buying houses with 95% or 100% of house value loans. The cause of this slowdown is singular. And we all know what it is, right? It was COVID where we said, let's take a healthy economy and put, flip the off switch, right? The minute we know we are out of this, there's either an antidote that says you get it and you're actually not gonna be that sick, feels like the flu for a day, or there's a vaccine and there's so much money going to that, it's imminent, it's just a matter of when. Is once we're out of this, there's no ambiguity of, hey, is it safe to go back in the water? You back up to 09, 10, and 11, right? it was such a deep hit that it became incredibly difficult to know when it was done. And that slows down the reinvestment from there. All right, that was a little more long-winded. I went longer than I wanted, I apologize, without interruption. But uh, at least we've got a little bit of context and hopefully we got some Q&A that's come in. Still interesting. So here's a quick question. Uh, when, when was the last time that the real economy and the financial markets were, were this disconnected? I think the answer to that is almost, they're almost always gonna be disconnected. And it goes back to that notion that your stock price today, which is the financial market, is looking not at the next year, not the next month, it's looking at the next 100 years. So it is always gonna be a disconnect. It's gonna look bigger now because the short-term hit is huge. Right? Like, geez, we're seeing real losses. Why is the market not doing as much? And the market says, okay, even if 2020 gave zero to those 500 companies, the S&P should only be down about 5% at most, as long as it was going to recover again in 2021. So I think the stock market coming down and then recovering back up to here as we realize we can kind of fight this, we've got some measures, I think we're going to be okay, kind of slow and steady, is that it's not expecting it to last like that picture I just showed for five years for it to go forward is, hey, within six to 18 months, we could be back running on all cylinders. Okay. Um, speculation. And how much do you think that plays into what, what has happened over the last three to four months and what might happen in the future? So, and by speculation, kind of meaning sort of maybe uninformed individuals sort of yeah. like and, into things or selling things? Yeah, which leads to a follow-up, which frankly is who, who is, where is all that money coming from? Right, we're placing bets in, in the financial markets, but who is it that, who are, who's doing that? Yeah, so no, I think that's, that, the answer to that question then makes the other one really, uh, I think it makes it more direct. At the end of the day, individuals sitting at home on their Robinhood account, sitting at home on their E-Trade account or Merrill Edge account, do not move prices. Right? There's just not enough money behind those trades. In fact, they're getting picked off by computers. We say, hey, I'm gonna buy 10 Microsoft today because Todd said it was awesome. I didn't say that, please don't uh, quote me on that, unless it goes up and share it. All right? That money coming in, all right, 150 bucks, there's 10, there's $1,500, isn't gonna move the price. Just to give you an example, you can see it. I pulled up one, and he didn't actually plant this question with me, but I was prepared for it anyway. All right? Is if I go over here, I just grabbed this morning when I was updating my slides, just grab Reliance. And I'm just sitting here at Yahoo Finance from here. I always go to this tab, and people from class may remember this. I go over and click on statistics. Right? Yeah, it's a bunch of high level stuff. But what I end up looking at over here is in this second column, far right column of what's the stock price history. Kind of come down here to share statistics, and here is the magic number. All right? What percent? of the 63 million shares outstanding in Reliance are actually owned by institutions. And if you're not an institution, you're an individual. Well, for Reliance, and it was the first one I pulled up, it fit my story so I didn't look any deeper, 90% of those shares, so what's that? 55 million of the 63 million shares are owned by institutions. Only 10 million are held by individuals or what we might call retail investors from here. This number for any publicly traded company that's not some startup or really small is almost always going to be in a 70 to 90% zone. Right? Individuals don't drive the stock market anymore. Who drives it are these big players. Right? We call them asset managers. Right? BlackRock manages $7.4 trillion globally. Right? 
Uh, Fidelity and Vanguard, another five and four trillion across the board. Right? Me playing around with Zoom might be a grand. I, where my retirement is, I'm just a teacher, so my $10,000 retirement account, hey, I outsource that to Vanguard. And they're the ones that are going to move prices. So I, with that said, this notion of, hey, markets are going crazy here because of speculators, I just don't buy it. It happens in Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's not a real market. I know I'll get some emails related to that. All right. So, so uh, I'm going to ask one more speculation question. Okay. Uh, it, it's not quite the same, um, but can you speculate on what might happen if we have a second COVID spike or, or a second round of the pandemic later this year? Um, conversely, what would, what would happen if we don't, if we're through the worst of it? Okay. So I don't even have to speculate there. The minute it becomes obvious that a huge wave has come in. So all of a sudden we've gone from, I don't know, 100,000 cases a day. We're also testing more, but once that levels out to we just had 50,000 new cases today, a five-fold increase from there, the market will immediately drop without question. And there's no speculation to it. Right now, what the market is built in is it's not over. I mean, people are kind of a little bit like, hey, when's the second wave coming? Let's be clear, we're still in the first wave. We're just kind of, we're riding it out. And luckily the wave's not 50 feet high. It's only about three feet high and sort of I'm able to walk through it. If any indication that that is going up or stays at that level, I think the market, if it stays at that level, would just be slow and steady. S&P should do about seven, eight, nine percent a year. And I think we would stay on that course. And I think the market's kind of priced in, we're gonna have a way to manage it, but the minute a wave came in, it would adjust. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, this is from Rick Zink and, and his audience question. Yep. Will the second round of a stimulus package play out the same as you de detailed uh, for the first round of the COVID-19 stimulus packages? And, and if it doesn't, what do you think the differences are? We already talked about one being infrastructure, but sure. is it just more of the same? Yeah. I mean, I think at least the ones that I kind of quoted of, or at least highlighted, I didn't quote it from March where, hey, let's put some cash into people that are hurting right now so that they can keep the lights on so we don't have as many defaults on rent and those things that then becomes more systematic. I think it would look exactly like that. It may move down the income stream. I can't remember what the top end was, but let's say it was 100,000 or less was the maximum and maybe you got $10. And then as your income was lower, naturally that number would go up. I think it may have a lower threshold if it were to come back and it probably wouldn't be quite as big, maybe not $1,200, but half of that. I think that's probably what we would see and they're keeping it in the back pocket to see if we don't, if we need it or not. Yeah. Because, you know, the job rates down from 20%, unemployment from 20 to 13% suggest people are coming back. Yeah. Right? Now, there was an incentive for somebody like, I can make more with the CARES money. Right? which is the people, if we furloughed anybody, we only furloughed a handful at Wash U at the business school anyway, because we actually run that like a business, shockingly. Right? Anybody we furloughed, we're like, you're actually better off for the next two months, then we can take care of you here, but the intention is to bring them back. So I think that would look similar. I'm not sure if that was you're getting after, Rick. I do think there's going to be an infrastructure, and I think that's sort of the, uh, you know, the silver bazooka, more than a silver bullet that I'm pretty sure Trump is going to try to push, but he's going to wait until he needs it to maybe move over the hump. Here, Hard here, to get away from politics there. Yeah. Here's another audience question that, that is interesting, and, and it's about the presidential election. Um, <laughs> Always dangerous. Yeah. Well, let's go I ahead. Don't know what happens there. Um, the way the question is worded is, what would the impact of the November presidential election be depending on whether Trump is reelected? So I, I am, I'm, a, I'm a free market kind of guy. And I would have, if there's like a full sweep, again, like we saw at the end of, OE, uh, of 08, um, of kind of, I shouldn't say Sleepy Joe, but it's just a name I've heard. I, Joe wins, sweep of the Senate, they retain the House, yeah, there will be more regulation coming out. I mean, it's kind of systematically shown. I personally believe that slows down the economy. I mean, I think that's been without question, and you saw it in that recovery, the down piece from there. Why did corporate profits go up in 17 and 18 is you made it 
less binding and less constraining to operate in the business world. Now, it wasn't just the tax effect. It was also other pieces, but reducing corporate taxes. And what that slide shows, and I'll hand those to you, is it didn't all just get paid out to investors. Now, first off, I have no problem with that. It's investors' money. My money's with Vanguard invested in Microsoft because I want to retire at some point, even though I love what I do. But even if it had all gone, I'd have been fine. But the proportion of what was paid out stayed exactly the same. Companies in 18 and 19 and at the end of 17 invested more in CapEx than they did in the previous eight years, more in research and development than they did in the previous years, and more in acquisition. So um, economically, I will not be happy in November if it switches to that side. Got it. I also think Trump's got to get his act together or he's got no chance. But economically, I think, uh, I think that's what's got to happen. Got to have an infrastructure spending bill. That's right. Um, Long-term impact to the economy of all of this stimulus. Uh, you mentioned that we're going to pay for it, but can, can you break it down a little bit? How do you think, is it going to be higher interest rates? Are we going to have to pay more taxes? I, I mean, what is the effect of this going forward? And, and where does it start to put the brakes on the real economy yeah. if, if it does at all? No, I mean, we're, you know, so when the government prints money or hands out money to stimulate the economy, you're borrowing from the future, all right? So it's like, hey, I'm having kind of hard times, so I find a 0% credit card, which still charges you 3% up front, but I'm like, hey, I'm just kind of borrowing from future income from there, all right? Now, that can be a good move, like I think this one was, but it does come at a cost. So just like when you eventually got to pay that loan back in a year, right, it's going to dampen what you could have otherwise done you're gonna clearly have some dampening to the real economy because we might have to tax a little bit more to be able to make sure that everything, we still kept the lights on and the bills are paid. The hope is, well, it's two things. One, if you don't do this, the alternative would be awful, all right? And then the real economy would really get crushed. If you can stimulate appropriately, and it is a guessing game where the real economy can actually grow more than it would have otherwise, I don't have to actually increase the cents on the dollar that I'm taxing individuals or governments because the coffers have gotten a little bit bigger. But at some point, you got to pay for the party. Is, is that kind of the classic lesser of two evils? Yeah, it is going to be the lesser of two evils because the evil of the economy completely shutting down in food lines is like, okay, I, what, whatever I have to do to avoid that is absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do I think it's going to show up in higher uh, interest rates? I don't know if interest rates are ever going to go back to what I would call normal, which is the previous 90 years before 2008. And even now, estimates from the market on expected inflation are less than 1.5% per year on average over the next 30 years. So I mean, interest yeah. rates only go up if inflation is going up. You can kind of think of as inflation goes up, it pushes interest rates up and goes down the other way. So my, my my kids will be happy because I, I remember my first mortgage and the interest rate was 13 and a half percent. Yep. My first two, uh, I, I was late to the party because I was just a teacher, Chris, right? We established this already. It was like seven and nine yeah. percent. Now I'm sitting on three and an eighth and I'm probably yeah. overdue to call my mortgage broker saying, what are we doing? Why haven't we refinanced this? Time to refinance. Which is staggering. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. staggering. We've got a couple questions about specific industries and, and I'll start with the obvious one because we're in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, there's a chase for a vaccine going on right now. Yep. And um, can you talk a little bit about where the money to fund that research is coming from? And what are the rewards for the companies that win, produce a viable vaccine? Yeah. So, and I think the money is already there. So people racing in to say, hey, I want to jump in. I heard Pfizer has some cool stuff going. I'm going to go buy Pfizer stock. Well, I'm not buying Pfizer stock from Pfizer. I'm buying Pfizer stock from Chris who said, hey, I don't think Pfizer's gonna win and you sell it. So the money that all of the companies that are already on their own are investing is just the reinvestment of their own profits. Now clearly, you know, just like you prepare your capital budget each year, out of that capital budget that for the farmers would, might have gone to something else, they've clearly tilted and said, we need to do a little bit more on this side. So the money is already in the companies being put to work, but clearly amplified in those spaces. 
from a market standpoint, you're going to get everybody right now is we don't know who the winner is going to be, but in the drug market, whoever is first to market, even if you're only 90% as good as the next one, you get 60, 70% of the market share. And that'll probably be even greater in this one. So as an individual investor, like I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of money in each of those 10 and whichever one wins, boom, it's going to go up hundred percent that day. All right. And the others are probably going to take a drop because they're all built in as all right, 10 companies. You all got a one in 10 chance of making $11 billion. All right. As soon as I find out which nine aren't getting it, they drop a little bit and the other one's going to go up. We've talked a lot about, um, stable real real economy companies high tech companies google apple folks like that what about the emerging markets what do you think is going to happen there and how much change are we going to go through in regard to supply chains and the effect of of having less china involved in, in uh, our supply chains there's a lot there's a lot layered in that one chris so i'm sorry I'm yeah, I mean, at a first piece, I may have to come back. And I'm not a supply chain expert. We may have to get Panos back in here with the bullwhip and to, uh, <laughs> to opine on some of those pieces. From an emerging market standpoint, I think what's going to allow those economies to keep growing, which may directly or indirectly then have demand for your own industry, but the rest, is if there is widespread distribution of the vaccine once we have it. Right, that's going to be absolutely critical. Clearly, U.S., we're going to make it. We're going to win. Right, we do. That's just how we roll. And everyone in the U.S. is going to have the vaccine. To make sure that we can keep the lights on and party like we've been doing economically for 60 years, we got to make sure that our partners and those new markets, frontier and emerging, can do it because that's where our ultimate growth is coming from. Supply chain with China, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. I may, uh, since I'm recorded, I might stay a little bit away from that one as we do have some collaborations with, uh, with China. But it's been interesting to watch from the sidelines there. I mean, so even though you're in academia, you have to hedge your bets a little man, bit. I still, I'm still trying to keep my lights on in the business school and we rely quite a bit on students. Um, I mean, our revenue stream has taken a huge hit this year. We are managing through crisis as well and doing stuff the companies are, right? We're not contributing to our 401ks. University's taking a year off of that. I've taken yeah. a 15% pay cut because I'm in the dean's office. Right. Other things are going through. So you're do we're doing the same kind of stuff that you got to do in the real world. But yeah. I don't like to be part of the real world. Out, okay. You're really part of the real world. This, this um, the real world. Another, another industry that's come up is automotive. Yeah. Even before the pandemic, automotive was tailing off a little bit. And, and then the pandemic hits and plants are closed. But um, going forward, assuming things come back, um, what's the prognosis on, on the automotive industry in your opinion? Yeah, I think, you know, it's going to be, I think in light of, so if these predictions, the total income only drops for American households by two, 3%, then it should go back to wherever it was pre-COVID, right? which was maybe falling just a little bit as people maybe wait for the next thing, a little bit of uncertainty of kind of what's happening, maybe a hedge against my taxes going up after November. Um, but if incomes only drop 2%, I think you're gonna see people going back in just like they're out to restaurants, like, okay, now I'm willing to go to a car dealership. It was a great time to buy a car. I did upgrade my Raptor first, uh, first week of quarantine because mm -hmm. they're like, who buys a car then? I'm like, the person that says no one's buying a car. So <laughs> invoice is a great price from there. So I did my part to help the, uh, the real economy there. Always uh, a Raptor. Yeah, way more fuel efficient than the last one. It's at least like 14 miles per gallon now. All right, like, all right. There these you go. on here. Uh, just some easy ones I can click off. Stock ownership statistics shown that I went through. Where do insiders fall? They're going to be on the retail. So they would not, insiders won't be included as part of that institutional side. And so they do have an insider number up there as well. The one exception you'll see where institutions won't hold 70, 89% of the stock is when the founding CEO is still such a huge player in the firm, All right? So Microsoft, I could have grabbed, and I think it's 70 or 80% because Gates doesn't own 30, 40% of it anymore, right. right? But if you look at Amazon, Bezos, well, he's got half of that now. But Bezos going across the board, right, he still has a huge chunk of it, which just means there's less shares for some of the institutions. 
All right, so we're almost out of time. I'm gonna ask one more of the remaining questions. Um, and it's kind of an open-ended thing, but just from your perspective, and you've been dealing with this industry now for almost a decade and a half, what does this industry need to do right now? Number one, buckle down. I mean, it's gonna be, be rough for a bit. I mean, there's no data that suggests, hey, this thing's turning around right away in the ways that look through. I buckle down. I think retain some optimism. I don't want to sound like your counselor from here. I do tend to be an optimistic. I always try to find the bright side from there. But there was a reason that I wanted to pick up how at least a sampling. And those were just the first five I looked at. I didn't cherry pick just the ones that have come up. But since the market, which got smacked as we thought this could be the end of the world and we dropped 30%. Right. But from that day, almost everyone but one company is up and up quite a bit. Right? which suggests investors for the long term still have faith in the business. If they didn't have faith in the business, you would look like American Airlines, which is still down 45% on the year, not down 10, 12, 13% on the year. And then like anything, I mean, I'm not, so I'm a left brain guy. So there's like three gray cells on my right side from a creativity standpoint. But thinking about, I mean, anything that helps articulate or craft, what is this new normal going to look like, right? Whether it's less travel, less working in offices, whatever that looks like, what part of that can you make better, right? And that was kind of, you know, the notion of, you know, maybe we repurpose spaces to open air, bigger auditoriums, right? Okay, well, now maybe we need this. Maybe there's finally a use for strip malls. I don't know. Or for the big shopping malls. But finding ways where you can pivot, I think it's kind of like, what can we be doing that's there? The market's expecting you to come up with something. Right? Or you wouldn't have seen up 20, up 30, up 60% from that side. Right? All right. Well, I wish we could answer all the questions, but it's, it's, it's just the truth that we're out of time. <laughs> so, Todd, I, I want to thank you for all your time today. It, it, it's always interesting to talk to you. Um, if anybody in the audience has additional questions for Todd, you could send them to me and I'll make sure Todd gets them. Yeah, that's the easiest. Uh, or if I can interrupt you, Chris, I mean, yeah, I'm easy sure. to track down. It's just my last name at Wustel.edu. Like, go to my webpage. My email's on there. Remind me that, hey, I was just on the webinar, so I don't think you're one of my students who I give the Heisman to. I'm like, hey, figure that crap out on your own. But no, okay. I see a couple of these that I wish I could get to as we're sitting here. But yeah, send them directly to me. Easiest, if you want to send them to Chris, he'll give them to me, and I can I can yeah, absolutely in mass. Yeah. Okay. Um, Everybody on the call, uh, on the webinar today, you'll receive an email in 24 hours and it asks you to fill out a post webinar evaluation. Please do that so that we can get the benefit of your wisdom on what other topics we should be offering every week and frankly, how we can do better. So uh, it's really important that you fill that out um, and help us in that regard. So we're gonna end it here. Todd, once again, thank you uh, on behalf of MSCI and thanks to the Olin Business School for making you available for us. <laughs> and everyone, have a safe day and stay well. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. Be good, everybody, and feel free to reach out. We'll see you next time.